This is lecture two of two of the online lectures to cover for um, the February 21st class period. Um, in this one, we're largely going to talk about enzymes, enzyme activity, and enzyme regulation. And um, that's pretty much where we'll end up so that on Monday, we can start getting into redox reactions and then build those into glycolysis and respiration. So at the end of the last lecture, we finished up on this slide here where we had our reactants and our products and the, the, transition, <coughs> excuse me, the transition state in the middle that's that hump that we need to get over for the reaction to run, which brings up the question of how can we make reactions happen more readily? So knowing that we have to get over that reaction hump or that we need some reactions to occur despite the fact that some of the um, orientation might not be right when we get collisions or that we might not have enough kinetic energy um, to drive the reaction to happen, how do we actually get this to work? Because in a biological system we need it to work. So the first thing that we can do is simply just increase the concentration of the reactants. And so this is something that, that in the lab you've had the ability to look at is how do we make reactions happen more readily or how do we increase rates of reactions and so something that you can do is simply increase the concentrations you get more collisions between the actual reactants themselves you're more likely to have those collisions happen when you have the precise orientation and you're more likely to have the collisions happen with the right amount of energy because there are just simply more collisions going on so you're more likely to have the energy hit with the proper amount. So another thing that we can do is increase the temperature. So when you increase the temperature, things move quicker. Again, you get more collisions. You get more collisions with more energy, which is why we see that temperature is part of our delta G calculation. So as temperature increases, it's going to multiply the increase in entropy. And so if we have more disorder and we have more reactions happening and more reactions hitting, we're more likely to have a reaction go where it's going to hit in the precise orientation with the right amount of energy that's going to actually drive a chemical reaction to happen. So the last thing that we might be able to do is to simply reduce the activation energy. And so in reducing the activation energy, <clears throat> it means that we're making that hump that we need to get over for the reaction to go smaller. Um, and so that's the amount of kinetic energy required to make the reaction go or the amount of energy required to get past that transition state in the reaction. And so we've previously defined a catalyst as something that's going to increase the rate of reaction without being consumed. Or well, we probably previously defined a catalyst as something that increases the rate rate of reaction. We did this when we were talking about the roles of proteins, and that one of the most important roles of proteins is to be a catalyst. Um, so again, a catalyst is anything that's going to increase the rate of the reaction without being consumed by the reaction. So it doesn't factor into the reactants. It doesn't factor into the products. It just makes the reaction go quicker, and it does this once again by simply lowering the activation energy. So <clears throat> we'll see later with enzymes and catalysts are the same that it does not affect the delta G. The energetics of the reaction stay the same but we lower the activation energy and we're more likely to have the reaction be able to have enough kinetic energy to get over that hump and be able to move. <clears throat> so enzymes again are what we call proteins when they're acting as catalysts. So once again, one of the most important roles of proteins is to act as a catalyst. And so when our catalyst is a protein, we call that an enzyme. Uh, most of the proteins that we would have seen that end in ACE fit as enzymes. So you guys in lab have used amylase, which is an enzyme that helps break down starch into glucose monomers. <clears throat> so these enzymes are able to lower the activation energy by doing a few things. So the first thing that they might do is that they can bring the substrates together in the precise orientation needed to react. So if you have, again, from the last lecture, if you remember, and this is an enzyme catalyzed, but just for an example, if it was, our oxygen and our hydrogen molecules that need to bind together such that the 
electron that's free in hydrogen hits one of the orbitals in oxygen that's free and there's a precise orientation for that to have happen the enzyme can actually grab the reactants hold them and put them in the precise orientation so that you are more likely to have the reaction go so additionally like noted it can reduce the activation energy and it's going to be able to do this through the ability to stabilize that transition state of the reaction. So as noted before, that transition state is where the reaction is at its most volatile. You're going to have things moving the most and it's going to be the least stable. And so the more that we can do to stabilize that transition state of the reaction so that when you break the bonds on your reactants, they don't fly all over the place and they're not able to be held there and new bonds made in the products, you're going to be better off. So by stabilizing that transition state, we're able to keep things together. They don't go flying off. And in the end, it reduces the activation energy because you have less energy or less instability in that transition state. And again, it's very important to note that this does not change the delta G. So the energetics of the reaction are the same. So if you required heat input before, you still require heat input now. Um, <clears throat> we just reduce the amount of energy that is required for the reaction to start. And that is what we are doing with an enzyme, is we are reducing the activation energy so that we can actually have the reaction start. All right, so <clears throat> if we look at the diagram from the book here, we can see once again that we have our standard free energy over progress of reaction that we have our activation energy when we bring in an enzyme or any catalyst what it does is it simply reduces this activation energy so again we see that the um, delta G hasn't changed but the reaction is more likely to go because we are stabilizing that transition state so these enzymes are able to facilitate the reactions and stabilize that transition shape excuse me stabilize the transition shape through a three-part process. So the first thing that we have is initiation. And in initiation, and we'll put this in our notes in, in just a minute here, um, what we have are the substrates, which are the reactants when you deal with an enzyme. So when an enzyme is involved, the reactants are the substrates, or what it specifically binds is its substrate. So we have the substrates come and bind to the enzyme. And so that's our initiation. And the places that they bind, we refer to as the active site. So the active side of the enzyme is bound by the substrates. Once they're bound, we have facilitation of transition. And so we see here that this particular enzyme actually changes shape to facilitate that transition from reactants to products. And so when we see that happen, we refer to that as an induced fit, where upon binding, things change shape. It's kind of like putting your hand into a glove is the metaphor quite often used there. And in this shape change, stabilizes the transition state, we're able to break the bond here, we form a bond there, and then in the end we can have termination where it lets go, and you see that our enzyme in the end is the same as our enzyme in the start. So once again, it is not consumed by the reaction that you're driving with the enzyme itself. So let's go ahead and get that put into our notes. So once again, with enzyme action, first off we have initiation. And so this is where our reactants, or again our substrates, which is what we call our reactants when they're interacting with an enzyme, bind to the enzyme at the active site. And this active site is going to be a fairly important term to remember, especially when we start talking about enzyme regulation. So after we bind at the active site, what we're going to see is transition state stabilization. Um, so once again, that transition state is where, or the point at which in the reaction that we have the highest energy that's moving the quickest that we need to be able to hold for this to work. So to stabilize that transition state, or in stabilizing that transition state, um, what it allows us to do is to break the bonds in our reactants while still holding them there and not breaking the bonds and then having them split out and run off all over the place. Um, and then we can orient the atoms properly. So if, if we're thinking of the example from the previous video with our hydrogen and with our oxygen, where we can hold those atoms 
in such a way that we can have the electron and the hydrogen bind to an unbound shell in the oxygen. We're going to be able to do that. Um, we'll form new bonds, holding them together. And um, for this to happen, it might require that the enzyme change shape. And so we'll talk about that here in just a minute again with the induced fit model. So we might see the enzyme change shape to actually facilitate this stabilization or the reaction itself. And then again, the last thing that we have is termination, where we release the products and we end up with the enzyme in the same state that it was when it started, where it's able to catalyze the same reaction. It is not consumed by the reaction. Again, it doesn't change the delta G, so the reaction energetics are the same. It's unchanged by the reaction itself, but it lowers that activation energy so that we're able to have the reaction happen more readily than we typically would. So in terms of um, binding to the substrates, um, there are a couple models that are discussed or quite often theorized with how this works. And so the first thing to note is that um, enzyme substrate binding is very specific. So there is high specificity um, f for the enzyme to bind the substrate. So that being said, the enzyme isn't going to go bind to other things that it's not specific to. So you guys have been working in lab with alpha amylase that binds to two glucose molecules that are bound with an alpha 1,4 linkage. So we're not going to be able to have that alpha amylase say go bind to something like a lactose molecule that has a beta 1,4 linkage between a glucose and a galactose. They don't have the right shape. It's not going to work. It's not going to be able to bind right. So we have very specific binding that gives us very specific activity. So the first way that this binding is theorized to work is the lock and key method. Um, and that's just like it sounds, how a key fits directly into a lock. Um, it's theorized that the three-dimensional shape or the geometry of the substrate fits the three-dimensional shape or the geometry of the enzyme in a complementary way. So when we were talking about enzyme folding, we would see that they fold and they make a specific shape and then there's some sort of active region in here. And so if we've got our Pac-Man shaped enzyme, we can see that there's a triangular active site. And so maybe we have our little triangular substrate here that's going to come in and be able to bind to the enzyme exactly where it is. And of course, in a real system, this is going to be much more complicated than a Pac-Man and a pizza. But what we see here is that our Pac-Man and our pizza are complementary to one another. And so it would fit with what we would consider to be a lock and a key mechanism. So the other mechanism of how enzymes bind their substrates we've talked about already in this lecture, and that's the induced fit model. So with the induced fit model, what, what that discusses or what that theorizes is that upon initial binding by the substrate, the enzyme has a catalysis in shape change that lets it more um, properly fit the substrate. So you have a little bit of binding, it changes shape, it fits the substrate properly, and then you can get good enzyme activity out of that. So um, once again, the way that that this is often best described, it's like putting your hand into a glove. When you have the glove, initially it's flopped over, but then as you put your hand into it, you're able to get all of your fingers in. It spreads out and it fits properly and it forms to the shape of the substrate, which in this example is your hand. So if we have our same pizza shaped substrate here, but maybe we've got an enzyme that clearly doesn't have um, a lock and key style fit. And so we'll have our substrate start to bind and then what will happen is upon that binding we have a catalytic change in the enzyme, we get a shape change in it, and now it properly fits and holds that substrate and we can get good activity out of it in terms of catalysis. So it's important to note that not all proteins um, of and by themselves have everything necessary to make a good shape. And so if we need outside factors to produce a good active site shape, we call those factors cofactors, as long as they are not proteins. So um, these cofactors, again, might be needed to have proper active site shape. And so um, common cofactors that we see are things like magnesium or other metal ions like that. Or you might have some of your vitamins, some of the key vitamins um, that you need to have, like a flavin.
acts as a cofactor, or we might have other random elements. The important thing again is that they're not proteins. If we have a protein that's required to come in as a secondary protein and um, make a proper active site, what will we ultimately have then is a dimer. And so we're seeing quaternary structure rather than a cofactor that we're defining. So these cofactors might act specifically on the active site, so they might come in and sit down and give a proper shape there, or we might see what we call allosteric binding. Um, and so we need to go ahead and define that. So allosteric regulation, either upregulation or downregulation of an enzyme is a very critical thing in a biological system. And so when we say allosteric binding or allosteric regulation, what we mean is that the regulatory factor, whether it's upregulating or downregulating, or in this case our cofactor, is binding the enzyme anywhere that is not the active site. So if we have active site binding, we just call it active site binding, or if it's inhibitory, we'll call it competitive binding, which we'll see here in just a minute. Um, but if it binds anywhere else, we refer to that as allosteric regulation. So we're binding anywhere but the active site, and what that ultimately does is it changes the shape of the enzyme. So we have a regulatory factor bind, it changes the shape of the enzyme to either give you the proper shape of active site or maybe the improper shape of active site depending on if you're trying to upregulate, downregulate, um, activate or inhibit. Um, so again it's important to note that these allosteric changes can either activate or inhibit enzyme activity. Um, so we use it to both turn it on and turn it off. So if we look at a diagram of this, so we've got our little Pac-Man guy that maybe isn't a fully functional Pac-Man. Um, and we need to have our pizza slice still bind it, which is going to be this blue pizza. And so this little green guy here is going to be a cofactor that's going to come in at the active site and do some active site regulation. And in this case, it would be activation or upregulation. And it's going to give us a proper active site that now we have the specificity to our substrate. We can bind and we can have proper activity. So conversely, if we were to put a second little dysfunctional Pac-Man guy down here that doesn't fit our pizza-shaped substrate properly, um, and maybe we've got this square green molecule that's able to come in and bind on the back side. Um, upon binding, it sets off a change in shape in the protein, in the enzyme itself. And now what we see up top is our pizza-shaped substrate active site so that our pizza substrate can come in and bind. So this top example here is an example of active site regulation where we're actually regulating the enzyme on the active site. In this case we're activating it and on the bottom we have a good example of allosteric regulation. So upon binding it changes the shape of the molecule or of the enzyme in such a way that now we have a functional active site and it's able to bind its substrate and we get action out of it. So again, we have active site which is binding in the active site or allosteric which is anywhere else and allosteric always changes the shape of the protein. So um, to further that discussion and talk about just enzyme regulation in general um, and or ways that we can affect the rate of an enzyme, we're going to start with inhibition. So in discussing enzyme inhibition, there are two um, key modes of inhibition that we're going to see, and, and these follow what we were just talking about in terms of cofactors. So the first off that we can have is competitive inhibition. And so competitive inhibition is where your inhibitory molecule binds up all or part of the active site. So it actually sits down on the active site itself, and it physically blocks the substrate from being able to bind the active site of the molecule and to be catalyzed um, and in or to those ends it keeps the enzyme from being able to work properly so we inhibit the enzyme in these actions so the other way that we can regulate um, or inhibit enzymes is with non-competitive inhibition and that follows the allosteric model so similar to what we see up in our example here still, rather than allosterically activating the enzyme, we allosterically inactivate the enzyme and we end up having it change shape and no longer can bind to its substrate and we're going to lose enzyme activity accordingly there. So other things that we can do 
to um, affect the rate of an enzymatic reaction so we can affect the substrate concentration and again you guys have had the opportunity to do this in lab in your amylase activity which is really nice and so you would have seen that if you increase the substrate concentration that it increased the reaction rate but it only did this to a point so we can definitely get to a point where our enzymes are going to saturate and so when an enzyme saturates it means that it's completely bound up by all the substrate and there's only so much activity that you can have so you know if you think of yourself as an enzyme and you've got two hands and you're moving a bunch of things from one side of the table to the other you can only ever have both of your hands full and so you're gonna get to a point where there's enough stuff on one side that you're moving to the other side that you're just gonna run out of the ability to continue to do more your activity is gonna be saturated and we're gonna see that with the enzyme where the activity saturates and it flattens out. So a couple other things that we can do, and again, you guys had the opportunity to do these in lab. You can change your temperature or you can change your pH. And we will <clears throat> stop here. We'll look at a couple um, figures that we have in the book that are going to uh, visualize some of the concepts that we're talking about. But when we pick up in class on Monday, we'll talk about temperature and pH, and specifically if there are effective ranges or if you can go too high or too low, and um, how these work with different enzymes. So as we look at the figures from the book, um, again, we can see our enzymatic mode of action that we had um, from before, where we have a normal enzymatic action, binding of substrates to the enzyme, stabilizing the transition state, and then termination where we have the products released. And then if we're going to look at our regulation, again, competitive inhibition is anything where your inhibitory or your regulatory molecule is binding up the active site. So where it's sitting in the active site here, we have competitive. And then over here where we have allosteric regulation, either to activate or inhibit, you can see that in this case it changes the shape. The enzyme is no, or the substrate's no longer able to bind to the enzyme. We don't have any sort of action. Or here, where we have an inducer, that it changed the shape, and now the enzyme is able to work. So again, we have active site binding, or we have allosteric binding to either activate or inhibit the enzyme that we have. And so then, we'll go ahead and look at an enzyme reaction. And once again, as we increase the substrate, which we see moving from left to right here, that the rate of the action of the enzyme is going to increase but it does definitely flatten out and it starts to saturate because the enzyme is doing all of the work that it can and there's now more substrate than it needs to it does not mean that you're not getting the maximum reaction possible but it means that you do plateau out at the maximum reaction possible so once again we'll pick up with the last little bit of chapter eight when we're back in class on monday um, there will be some clicker questions about the um, the the couple online lectures that we've had here so thank you for watching these and I hope that this was effective and that you guys enjoyed the in-class activity to review organelles and cell structure that we had so I will see you Monday and um, thanks for watching the lectures <laughs>